So last week we talked about how Adonijah made a second attempt to take the throne from King Solomon. And Solomon must have suspected that there were two other men with him on this plot. And so Solomon had his brother Adonijah put to death. And tonight we're going to see how he dealt with the high priest of Beathar and what we can learn from it. So in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 26, it says, And unto Abithar the priest said the king, Get thee to Anathoth, unto thine own fields, for thou art worthy of death. So Solomon judged him and found him guilty. But he said, But I will not at this time put thee to death. So why not? He said, Because thou bearest the ark of the Lord God before David my father, and because thou hast been afflicted in all wherein my father was afflicted. So he spared the high priest because he had been his father David's priest. So do you remember when David was on the run from King Saul, he ran to the tabernacle, and Abiathar's dad, Ahimelech, was the priest, and he gave David the showbread and the sword of Goliath. And remember, David fled to Gath, which is where Goliath is from. And Becky said she walked down them streets waving up that sword to everybody. But so then when Saul found out about it, he had the priest Ahimelech killed. And not only him, but all the priests. He killed 85 priests and their, their whole city, the women, the children, the animals. But there was one that escaped, and who was that? Abiathar. And what did he escape with? The ephod, remember? And who did he run to? He ran to David. And David said, stay with me. I'll be your safeguard. And so he stayed with David. He suffered with David. And he was loyal to David. So Solomon spared him. He just sent him home in disgrace, away from the palace the government, the tabernacle, and the altar. So look at verse 27. It says, So Solomon thrust out Abiathar from being priest unto the Lord, that he might fulfill the word of the Lord, which he spake concerning the house of Eli in Shiloh. So he's no longer priest. And this is huge because it fulfilled a prophecy and a punishment that God made a long time ago to Eli. And now Eli was the priest in the temple where Samuel grew up. And Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, they were also priests, but they were wicked. So they were God's priests serving in God's place, but the Bible says they knew not the Lord, so they were not saved. And so Eli tried to talk to them, but they wouldn't listen, and he just let it go on. But God would not. So look at 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 27 and 28. It says, And there came a man of God unto Eli, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And that I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me. He said, And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? So what tribe would Eli be from if he was a priest? So he would be from the tribe of Levi. And specifically, what family would he be from? Who would be his ancestors? So Aaron. So Aaron, so God said, out of all the tribes of Israel, I chose Levi. I chose your, the house of your father, Levi, to be my priestly tribe. And I chose the house of Aaron to be my priest. So this was a great, great privilege that they had. And so Aaron was the first high priest. And so Aaron, Aaron's sons would also be priests. And Aaron had four sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. Now, Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire unto the Lord, and they were killed, so they didn't have any sons. And then Aaron, when Aaron died, Eleazar became the next high priest. When Eleazar died, his son Phinehas became the next high priest. But eventually, we see that the high priest line switched to the line of Ithamar because Eli was a descendant of Ithamar. And so, and then Eli had... Hophni and Phinehas. Phinehas had a Hita, but Hita had a Ahimelech. Then Ahimelech had Abiathar, which was the current high priest in our story. But then, so God said, I chose Levi, I chose Aaron to be my priest. But then, look at verse 30. He said, Wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, Be it far from me. For them that honor me, I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. And so this was fulfilled 80 to 100 years later when Solomon kicked Abiathar out as being the priest. And look at what he did. So 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 35, it says, And Zadok the priest did the king put in the room of Abiathar. And Zadok 
was from the line of Eleazar. And so God fulfilled this prophecy that he made long ago when he switched the high priest line from the line of Eli and Ithamar back to the line of Eleazar. And so this is really cool. But here is the best part. So God also told Eli, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 35, he said, And I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in my heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before my anointed forever. So God was raising him up a faithful priest. So who was this priest? So let's look at Hebrews chapter 7. So look at verse 11. It says, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? So under the Levitical priesthood, these priests taught the people God's law, and they offered up their sacrifices, but there was no perfection here because the law could not save them, and these sacrifices could not take away their sins. And so God was going to raise up another priest, his faithful priest, that would not be after the order of Aaron. So it says there must be a new order of priesthood. And look at verse 12. It says, For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. So it says the priesthood was changed. And so the law was just a shadow of good things to come. The law, this new priest, he came and fulfilled the law. And all the Old Testament sacrifices pointed to him. And so we're going to look at the differences between the old order of priesthood and the new order of priesthood. So look at verse 13. It says, For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. So first we see there was a change of tribes. So this new priest was coming from a different tribe, one that Moses spoke nothing about concerning the priesthood. So what tribe did Moses speak about? Levi. And so what so Levi was the priestly tribe, but what tribe would this new priest be coming from? So look at verse 14. It says, For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, at which time Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. So the priest in the new order was from the tribe of Judah because our, the new priest, God's faithful priest, is our Lord Jesus Christ. And so this prophecy that God made, he told Eli, he said, I chose the house of your father in Egypt. I chose him out of all the tribes to be my priestly tribe. He said, But be it far from me. For them that honor me, I will honor. And so the prophecy was partially and temporarily fulfilled when God changed the high priest line from Ithamar back to Eleazar. But it was completely and eternally fulfilled when Jesus came and he changed the whole priestly tribe from Levi to the tribe of Judah. In the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, his son, Jesus. And look at verses 15 and 16. It says, And it is yet far more evident, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there ariseth another priest, who is made nothing, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. So we see there was a change in the tribe, and there was also a change in the qualifi qualification of being a priest. So in the old order, they were qualified to be a priest by a carnal commandment. So if they asked them, what qualifies you to be a priest? They would say, my dad was a priest. But it says Jesus was qualified to be a high priest because he has the power of an endless life. So if they asked Jesus, well, what qualifies you to be a priest? Then he could say, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And so the life and the immortality that he had within himself was his qualification to be a priest. And then verse 17, it says, For he testified, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So we see a change in the order. So the priests in the old order, they were after the order of Aaron. But Jesus is after the order of Melchizedek. So who is he? So we don't have time to get into the depths of him. But look at verse 1 of chapter 7. It says, He was a priest of the Most High God, 
And then verse 2, it says he was also a king, king of righteousness and king of peace. So Jesus, he's a priest, but he's also a king, the king of righteousness and the king of peace. In verse 3, it says he had neither beginning of days nor end of life. Jesus, he has no beginning, he has always been, and he has no end. I love this part, verse 3, it says he was made like unto the Son of God. And that's Jesus, he is the Son of God. And then verse 18, it says, For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. So we see there was a change in the result. So the old order was weak and unprofitable. It could not take away the guilt of sin or it could not save a soul. It shows you God's perfect standard and it shows you that you could not live up to it. And so the old order shows you that you are a sinner. But the new order... Shows you a savior, so isn't that much better? And so, look at verse 19. It says, For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. So in the old order, in the tabernacle, in the temple, there was a veil that was blocking the most holy place, showing you that you could not get to God for yourself. You had to go through a priest. But with Jesus, that veil was torn. So he is our way that we can draw, draw nigh unto God. So the old order leaves you in your sin, but the new order leaves you in Jesus. And then 20 and 21, it says, And inasmuch as not without an oath he was made priest, for those priests were made without an oath. And so there was a change in God's appointment of the priest. So Aaron and his sons were simply set aside as the priests. But Jesus God has declared him with an oath. And so an oath reinforces the truth. And so we find this oath, Psalms chapter 110, verse 4. It says, The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And so with an oath, God has appointed Jesus and he has declared the eternality of his priesthood. And then verse 22. It says, By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament or a covenant. So we see there was a change in the covenant. So the Levitical priesthood was under the Mosaic Covenant. And the Mosaic Covenant said, if you will obey, then you will be blessed. Then you will be my people. And so it's kind of like God threw out a rope. He was holding one end. They were holding one end. And they, they had the law there facing them, showing them God's perfect standard. But they couldn't live up to it. And they dropped their end of the rope. But Jesus, our great high priest, he came and he took our place on the cross. And he held up our end. Of the rope and he brought in the new covenant that doesn't start out as if you will obey but it says i will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities i will remember no more so aren't you thankful for that covenant and then 23 and 24 it says and they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death but this man because he continueth ever hath an unchangeable priesthood so then we see there was a change in the change. You, say, you might say, well, that don't make sense. But the Levitical priesthood was always changing because the priests would die and then their son would take over. But in the new order, it is unchanging because Jesus, God's faithful priest, he will live forever. And then, so we said the old order was weak. And this is the power of the new order. This is the power of Jesus. Verse 25 it says, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. So there's his power. He is able to save to the uttermost completely and eternally forever. And he's not just living forever, forever, but he's carrying on his work as our great high priest, ever living to make intercession for us. And then verse 26, it says, For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens. So we see a change in the character. So the, in the old order, the priests were sinful, but the only one that could save us from our sins had to be perfect, without spot, without blemish, so he was sinless. And so because those priests were sinful, they first had to offer up a sacrifice for themselves. But look at verse 27. It says, Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. So then we see a change in the sacrifice. So in the old order, there were many sacrifices and they were animals. 
But the Bible says it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. And so he offered up one sacrifice, and that was himself. And the blood of that sacrifice is enough to save the whole world. And now look at chapter 8, verse 1. It says, Now of the things we can, which we have spoken, this is the sum. So of everything we just said, this is the sum of it. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. So he's sitting because his work of redemption is finished. He came down, he took on our sins, he went to the cross, he died for them, he arose. He done everything he had to do for us to be saved. And now he's making intercession. So if you're lost, he's making intercession for you. Father, just give them one more opportunity to send the Holy Spirit to convict them one more time. And then if you're saved, he's pleading our case too. Father, they're covered by my blood. They're your child. Forgive them again, Father. Just forgive them again. And so you may say, well, he doesn't know what I go through down here. But we have a great high priest that knows. He came down and he walked this earth, so he knows. You may say, well, he doesn't know what it's like to be lonely. He knows. He doesn't know what it's like to be laughed at or made fun of. He knows. You may say, well, he doesn't know what it's like to be sorrowful or heartbroken. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He knows. You may say, well, he doesn't know what it's like to be tempted. He knows far more than we could ever imagine what it's like to be tempted. And he not only knows, but he cares. And then look at the last verse, chapter 7, verse 28. It says, For the law maketh me an high priest which have infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. And so in verse 11, we saw that the reason there was a change was because the old order was imperfect. It says the Son is consecrated forevermore. He is perfected forevermore. So the new order is perfect because Jesus is perfect. He is perfectly qualified to be our great high priest. He offered a perfect sacrifice, and he can make you stand perfect before a holy and a righteous God only by being covered by his perfect blood.